Okay. Well, welcome everybody. It is um, the kickoff, the launch to our Positive Charges Compassion is Lit project. And we are very excited to launch this project. Um, we, um, to begin with, I want to explain for anyone who does not know what positive charge is, I want to just do a, a quick run through what positive charge is, and then we'll get into our um, feature presentation. Um, I'm Sally and I'm with Positive Charge. And um, we've got Karen and Bonnie and Jan on here as well with Positive Charge. Um, we are um, a nonprofit organization here in Portland. Our sole mission is to amplify kindness. And we do this by offering different opportunities to the public to make um, a positive impact in the community. And we do this um, to um, allow or just offer opportunities to do good deeds, to share good news and to create community. And the different ways, the different buckets as we call them, um, that we do that is we, um, we can do projects and um, events that um, offer volunteer time. Um, we build, help build tiny homes for houseless um, neighbors in the city. Um, we create art for causes um, that, and one example of that is sewing um, um, animal toys for Project Pooch, we've done that. Um, we do collections for causes. We have an ongoing event um, for that called One Can Wednesday and Two Can Tuesday, where it, uh, we collect food and give that to the Neighborhood House, which is a local food pantry in Portland, and they distribute it to people who are experiencing um, food insecurity. Um, and we also do emergency kindness events. And emergency kindness events um, are not scheduled. They're not planned. They actually just they're done in response to something that just happens. And um, for example, um, when migrant children and families were fleeing Central America, um, we um, gathered the community, the community really gathered itself, and we um, collected items of necessity and filled and delivered over a thousand backpacks uh, down to the US-Mexico border to help those children and their families who were down there. So that's an example, just one example of the many um, examples of emergency kindness events, especially during the pandemic. We've been dealing a lot with those types of events. Um, all the events that we have done and that we are doing and will be doing are all on our uh, website, um, positivechargepdx.org, and um, we welcome you to take a look at our website um, so you can become familiar with us and join us in doing them. Um, we, uh, one more um, thing about our projects and events, we did two very recent projects that were super successful. Um, in our eyes, everything is very successful. <laughs> Um, but the two most recent events I want to tell you about are, um, we did one event, which was a collection. This was not an emergency kindness event, um, but it was a, a collection that we did in the community um, where we collected um, new and gently used um, purses and filled them with items of necessity and gave them to the Salvation Army emergency, women's emergency shelter. And um, what they do is they then um, give those out to uh, women who are leaving the shelter, um, transitioning back into life, and it gives them it gives them something to then you know bring with them when they probably left whatever situation they were in with nothing. So that was one really super uh, event that we just finished, and we are just now finishing another really cool project, um, to, which is another uh, event. This one's at um, an emergency kindness event, and it is called the Healthcare Heroes event. And we are, um, have um, collected and made um, all kinds of things dealing with um, focusing on the 
the mental health of the frontline healthcare workers in local hospitals. And we put together self-care kits um, with all kinds of cards that school students um, have made and um, um, warm, soothing, weighted neck wraps that people have sewn and um, all kinds of lotions and uh, bath salts and, and just very soothing things that people have put together in kits. And we've delivered those to a number of ICUs and emergency departments around town. And so those were very well received as well. So um, with that introduction about who we are, we are so happy to introduce um, this new project. I want to ask everyone who is here to um, mute your microphones. And if you have anything, any questions at all during our presentation to please go ahead and um, put them in the chat. And um, there is going to be a Q&A afterwards, conversation afterwards, and, um, and that's, how, that's how we'll do that type of interaction. Um, I'd love to introduce, I'm so excited to introduce Mary Catherine um, uh, McElroy. She is not only my neighbor, um, she's also an elementary school librarian in Vancouver Public Schools. Um, she um, loves working with diverse populations in the school. She is very knowledgeable and very creative. And um, she is such a delight to talk to. I can just, wow, one conversation that starts is just a couple minutes can just go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Mary Catherine and I will just send the stage over to her. So thank you. Thank you, Sally, for that kind introduction. Um, we're, we are gonna to talk today about something I'm very, very passionate about, which is diverse literature. Everyone deserves to see them re themselves represented in books. And I was really happy when Sally and Positive Charge approached me about this project, um, which is called Compassion is Lit. And by lit, we mean both exciting and literature. Um, so today we're gonna to look at what this project is, why it is important, why we need diverse books, what you can do to help, and I'll have some book recommendations for you from some of my favorite books that are out right now. Um, so as I said, this is a positive charge project. And one of the questions I often get asked is why is it so, why do you focus so much on diverse literature? And it is really, it's only recently that a lot of your neighbors have been able to see themselves in books. This isn't um, something that was common when I was a child, and it's something that's really needed. And I'm gonna turn this over to, um, we need diverse books so that you can hear from people themselves about why diverse books are important to them. Parker Lee. I'm Charlotte Spencer. I'm Abby. Sam. Savannah. I want to be a graphic designer when I grow up. A children's physician. I want to be a ballerina fashion designer. An artist. Happy. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Matt Delapena, and we need diverse books. I feel like I'm a living embodiment of why we need diverse books. Growing up, I wasn't a great student. Um, I was what people call a reluctant reader. I felt like literature was a club that I didn't belong to. Like anybody else who isn't good at one thing, I found other things to get involved with. For me, it was sports. I was pretty good at basketball in particular. And because of basketball, I became the first De La Pena to go to college. Once I was at my university, I was introduced to one specific book that changed everything for me. It's called The Color Purple. And it was the first time I had ever had an emotional reaction to a book it almost moved me to tears. And from that point on, I went in search of that feeling elsewhere. And I realized that books became my secret place to feel. From African-American female authors, I found Hispanic authors. And from that point on, I felt like all I wanted to do was be a part of the world of literature. It doesn't matter if you're African-American, Asian, disabled, part of the LGBTQ community, we all need to see ourselves in books because if we don't see ourselves in books, we may not feel as connected to the human experience, the story of all of us. 
At the same time, books are more than mirrors. They're also windows. I've always believed that reading is the ultimate form of empathy. Yes, we'd love to find ourselves in books and read about ourselves and our own experiences, but it's also important to read about people who aren't like us. It's only then that we'll have a full understanding of the world around us. Hi, my name is John Green and we need diverse books. I think we need diverse books because we need to reflect the reality of our communities and that reality is a very diverse one. One of the magical things about reading to me is that it helps me to imagine the life outside of myself. These books give all readers a glimpse into a culture that may not they might not be familiar with. I was a huge reader when I was a kid. But I didn't see a lot of myself in the books that I was reading. I remember in my later teens running across a book called Blood Brothers by Stephen Barnes. That was pretty much the time when I saw something that really made me feel like I was seeing a piece of myself in the world. I'm trying to think of when I was a kid what the most sort of diverse book was that I read. And I'm having a hard time thinking of it, which is I think in a way what underscores the entire campaign. I didn't know women black women could write books, and I didn't know why I didn't know this. I don't want my children to grow up like me, not having not having read anybody that, you know, looks like When them. you read, you're reading to discover the essential truths in life. Everybody should be able to go into a bookstore or a library and look at the shelves and be able to see themselves looking back. So now you know why our Diverse Books campaign is so important. If we can reach our campaign goal, this will just be the beginning of us putting diverse books into the hands of young readers. Giving children diverse books and getting them into reading in general will open up so many doors for them. And I know, because that's what diverse books did for me. Join us, donate, and share this message so the story of all of us becomes everyone's story. was from an organization called We Need Diverse Books, but it really reflects what Positive Charge is trying to do with the Compassion is Lit project. Oops, stop that, sorry. Um, so he referred to, Matt De La Pena, who's a wonderful writer, referred to the research of Dr. Redeen Sims Bishop, who in 1990 published a study that talked about how people need to have mirrors in literature. So those are books where we see ourselves reflected in literature and windows where we get to observe someone else's life through reading and also sliding glass doors. Those are uh, books where you actually get to step into someone else's experience and feel what they're feeling just by reading. And it's a very important part of the human experience, but that, study was done in 1990 and even in 2018 when the University of Wisconsin at Madison did a study of children's literature. All the children's literature published in the United States, they found that 50% of the books had white characters, 27% of the books had animals as the main characters, 10% of the books had African Americans as the main characters, 7% had Asian Pacific Islanders featured as the main characters, 5% had Latinx characters, and only 1% had American Indian First Nations representatives. And that makes it very hard for people from those groups to see themselves in literature. And even when they did, the images might not have been very good or even very representative. It just means that you could tick a box saying that, okay, I've seen the Latinx character in this book. So over the past few years, obviously there's been a big push for diverse literature and especially in the last two years, there's been an explosion of amazing books. And part of the reason why is that books can really boost your um, morale, it can make you feel better in your mood, it can help you relax, um, uh, lowers your stress by 68% reading and can even lengthen your life by two years. And books can bring people together. We also have the problem in this country of book deserts, where although low-income children on average have four books, four children's books in their home, a team of researchers concluded that nearly two-thirds of children, 61% of low-income families they studied, own no books for their children at all. Placing books in the hands of children fundamentally influences their chances for both personal and academic success. So that 
brings us to Positive Charges Compassion is Lit campaign, getting those books into the hands of kids and adults who need them. My focus, I'm an elementary school librarian, as Sally said, so my focus is really on kids, but you shouldn't limit your scope to kids. It's just what I know best. Um, so you'll hear a lot of things about kids today, but don't let that limit the books you are donating and sharing and talking about. So what are we asking you to do? We're asking you to read books, read books that reflect an experience different from your own. Share those books with others by discussing the books with friends, creating perhaps a book club where you can discuss the books and choose them as a group, or, and posting the books you're reading on social media with the hashtag compassion is lit and tagging positive charge PDX. And then we'd love for you to donate those books to free little libraries throughout your community or to the Portland Children's Book Bank or other organizations. If you know a, a school that might need these books or a teacher who might need diverse books for their classrooms, because remember, many teachers have to provide their own, actually, I, every teacher I've ever met has to provide their own classroom library. It's really hard for them to diversify the books that are in their classroom for their students. Um, and if you could help even just your child's teacher with that, that would be amazing, or a teacher that you know in the community it would really make a big difference for them. Where do you find these free little, uh, little free libraries? As you can see, Portland is so lucky. We have so many of them. I only put in Portland. So there are free little libraries in all these other areas, but I only asked the, this map to give me where they are with the Portland address. So there are plenty of places for you to share the books that you purchase, the diverse books that you purchase. And you can get to it by going, I'm gonna click on the Free Little Library site and you can see their wonderful site and you can use their map to put in whatever location you want or library name or zip code, whatever works best for you to find a place where you can donate those books. I know I've got three in my little tiny neighborhood right here in uh, Bridal Mile. You can also donate them to the Children's Book Bank, which is a fabulous organization. I personally think it's one of the best things about Portland. It's an organization that collects good quality children's books and distributes them to kids who don't have books in their homes. Um, it is, and they are especially looking for diverse books right now, because very often when we're donating books we have in our homes, because it wasn't when my kids were little, which wasn't that long ago, there weren't that many diverse books available. I don't have very many to donate. So they really are hoping that people will go out and buy or find diverse books because they're, they have a lot of kids who come to visit the Children's Book Bank and they need to see themselves reflected in the literature that they're reading and their family's experiences. I promised Sally I would recommend some books. These are books that I have loved. They do tend to focus on the elementary end, um, just so you're aware, but I think you'll love them too. And they are great books to donate and give to friends and to talk about. So first one I want to talk about is called The Eyes, Kiss, and the Corners, and it is by Joanna Ho. Um, and it was illustrated by Dung Ho. Joanna Ho is a educator in, in California, and she also is someone who grew up not seeing herself in books. So it was really important to her to write a book about people who look like her. Um, she's Vietnamese American, and her illustrator, which is really cool, has the same last name, but she actually lives in Vietnam. So it's kind of a cross-cultural thing where an American writer had a Vietnamese uh, illustrator illustrate this stunning book. Um, here are some other books that I really love. This is by, this series is by Andrea Beatty and illustrated by David Roberts. And these are about the kids who are in second grade all together um, in one class. So even though each book focuses on one person in the class, you will see these other characters show up in every book. So Sofia Valdez is one of my favorites. It's about Sofia, Sofia Valdez, future president. And she is a community activist. And she sees a problem in her community that there is too much trash and a lot of people in her community can't go outside of their homes, which would be familiar to a lot of us during the pandemic. So she decides to create a park where there used to be trash in her community. And she has to figure out how to organize everyone in her community, get on board with this project and um, make a difference for their community. 
The next book in this series is Aaron Slater Illustrator. This just came out this last month and it is fabulous. It's about this little boy named Aaron who is an amazing, he's an amazing artist. He loves to draw and he loves to hear his parents read him books and he loves stories and he cannot wait to read. And he tries and tries and tries to read and he can't do it. And he thinks, okay, once I get to school, I'm gonna be able to read. And he walks into kindergarten on the very first day thinking by the end of today, I am going to be able to read. But he doesn't learn how to read that first day. And he doesn't actually learn how to read for, very, for many months. And eventually they realize that he has dyslexia and needs a, just a little more help. So even though he is a fantastic storyteller and a fantastic artist, he just has to work a little harder on his reading and get special help from his school. So I love that book. Rosie Revere Engineer is about a girl who is an engineer who builds the most amazing things, but she will never let anyone see them because she is embarrassed that they might make fun of her. Because one time she made a flying cheese cocker hat and her uncle laughed. And after that, she hid all of her inventions under her bed and wouldn't share them with anyone. But when her aunt Rosie comes to visit, Rosie tells her stories about being a Rosie the Riveter during World War II and how she built the planes and her only dream she had left in her whole life was to fly. Rosie Revere, engineer, decides that she needs to solve her Aunt Rosie's problem and build her a flying machine. Will Rosie be able to build her a flying machine to help her aunt realize her final dream? Will Rosie be brave enough to show her inventions to the world? You have to read that book to find out. Iggy Peck Architect is about a little boy who is a compulsive architect. He needs to build out of absolutely anything that he has. And when he gets to Miss Lila Greer's second grade classroom, she tells him that he has to stop building and he cannot do it in her class. They have other things to do. But when the class goes on a field trip and Miss Greer faints and um, they have to get her back across the, the, the river or stream, I can't remember which it is, only Iggy Peck can figure out a way to build a way to get Miss, um, Miss Greer and the second graders of his classroom back to safety. Ada Twist Scientist is about a little girl who is compulsively asking the why question and driving her parents crazy. And, um, and they keep asking her to stop until they realize that that is just who she is and she is going to do amazing things one day. This whole series, and this series will grow. It's just absolutely incredible. Such wonderful books. And as I said, the kids love finding these other characters in the different books. Oh, there we go. Ohanami's Family is a story about uh, Hawaiians, which a lot of us don't realize how many Pacific Islanders and Hawaiians we have in our Vancouver, Portland community, but it is a significant population and it's really nice to see them reflected in this wonderful book which is very much like the house that Jack built if you know that story from your own childhood but this one is about the family working together um, to make their traditional Hawaiian meal and it's a beautiful rhyming book that will get everyone involved. Milo Imagines the World is by Matt De La Pena, who's the author you saw earlier, and it's one of his newer books, and it is just wonderful. It's about this little boy who gets on the subway with his sister, and every person he sees on the subway, he just imagines what their life is like, including a little boy on, or an old, slightly older boy on the train who's wearing a suit and bright white sneakers. He imagines that that boy lives in a castle and has a butler, and he has this amazing life. But when the boy gets off at the same subway stop as Milo and they walk to the same neighborhood, he realizes that you can't judge people by the way they look. I Will Dance is about a little girl who has cerebral palsy who just wants to dance. She's always known she's a dancer, but she isn't really welcome in traditional dance classes until one day she finds a dance club or a dance group that is looking for everyone to be part of the dance. Um, it's really, really wonderful. And this is a Washington Children's Choice nominee this year. So a lot of kids across Washington are reading this book and I would highly recommend it. We Are Grateful is by Tracy Sorrell, who is a member of, an enrolled member of the Cherokee tribe. And this book is written in English and in Cherokee, um, both in the transliterated version and in the way 
Cherokees traditionally written. And this is a really beautiful book that looks at Cherokee culture, both in the past and today, by taking us through four seasons of Cherokee celebrations, big and small. It is a fabulous book. And if you don't know Tracy Sorrell, you should really get to know her writing. She is, she's written a lot of books. And this is the first of two I'm going to talk about today. But this is just, just incredible book. And especially this month is Native American Heritage Month. This would be a wonderful book to be sharing with others. And this is another book that Tracy Sorrell finished for the author Charlene Wilting McManus. Charlene Wilting McManus unfortunately died before she got to finish this book, but it is her memoir of when she was a member of the Umpqua tribe in the 1950s, lived here in Oregon, not too far from where you are right now. And in the 1950s, the federal government told the Umpqua tribe that you are no longer a tribe and you may no longer live on this reservation. You're just gonna have to find somewhere else to go. So this is about Charlene's family and them having to uproot from everything they'd ever known and everything their ancestors had ever known and moving to Los Angeles and figuring out who they are, who they were, and what does this all mean? If, I'm, if I no longer have my central identity of being part of the Umpqua tribe, who am I? Um, it's extraordinary. And it's not too long ago. Like this happened to people you probably have met in your life living in the Pacific Northwest. Um, related, I chose this book by Christine Day called I Can Make This Promise, which is a modern day book. And that's something that um, a lot of Native Americans really ask us to keep in mind is they really want people to have stories of um, Native Americans in the modern day, because many children are taught everything in the past tense, particularly when we come to around this time of year, Thanksgiving. So they only hear about Indians did this, Indians were this, and they don't hear about them in the modern day. So Christine Day is a member of the Upper Skagit tribe. And she wrote this wonderful book about a young girl and people are constantly asking her, where are you from? Who, you know, you look like you belong to a tribe. What tribe do you belong to? But she doesn't know. Her mother was adopted by a white couple in the seventies and she has no idea of if she, if, she has any Native American heritage. And if she does, what, what tribe would she belong to? Um, one day she gets frustrated and she starts digging in the attic and she finds a pile of letters from a woman in the 1970s who um, turns out to have been her grandmother who went to Los Angeles to become an actress. And although she wasn't successful becoming an actress in Los Angeles due, due to the constraints of the time, she did come back to the Seattle area pregnant and very excited to have her baby. And when she goes back to the reservation, she plans to stay there because she knows she can't go to Seattle because if you go to Seattle um, and you belong to a local tribe, there is the chance that your baby will be taken to you, taken from you and forced into an adoption situation. And that is very recent history. And that is what this book is about. I can make this promise. And I hope I didn't give it way too much. It's a really excellent book. <laughs> um, a Long Walk to Water is by Linda Sue Park, who is an amazing writer. And this is a book that takes place, it tells two parallel stories. One is about a, a boy um, and in, the in the 1980s, and he lives in Senegal, and his village is attacked, and his family scatters, and he has to run on his own and try to get to the border of Kenya without any family support, trying to just survive, lion attacks, the attacks of soldiers. And meanwhile, we're also reading about a girl whose job it is, 30 years later, whose job it is to get water for her family every day. But when an organization comes to her village to create a well, how will that change her life? Will she be able to go back to school? A Long Walk to Water is a beautiful book about two stories that intersect as they work toward um, the goal of having water for their communities. Prairie Lotus is also by Linda Sue Park, and it is about a young girl who is part Chinese and part um, Euro-American in the 1850s in the Dakota Territory. Her mother has died in San Francisco, um, her mother who was Chinese, and her father now takes her to form a new business in the Dakota Territory. Um, but the village decides that she's the only Chinese American there, and the village decides that um, or think some people in the village feel that she should not be allowed to go to school in their town. So the, she needs to convince the town that she will not disrupt the school. That was her mother's only dream for her was that she finish high school 
And now that dream is in jeopardy because they've moved to the Dakota Territory. Will she be able to fulfill her mother's dream that she get a high school degree, which was not usual for girls? Will she also be able to achieve her own dream that she become a dressmaker slash tailor and have her own business? You really have to read this book and find out. And Linda Sue Clark, who is um, Korean American, wrote this book because she loved Little House on the Prairie when she was young. But she also knew that there were other stories out there. So this is kind of an echo to that. So if you ever read those books when you were young, perhaps try Prairie Lotus. It's really quite extraordinary. The War That Saved My Life is about young Ada in London during World War II. And Ada is born to a mother who really didn't want kids, but she was trying to get the husband to stay. And when Ada is born, she's born with a club foot. And her mother is so embarrassed that she uh, refuses to take Ada out of the house and forces her to stay home and won't allow her to walk or have the needed operation to fix her foot. After a few years, her mom has a baby boy, a brother, and uh, Ada gets to take care of him. And it's really wonderful. But Ada's brother does not have a disability. So eventually Ada's brother gets to go outside and play with the other kids on the street and go to school, all opportunities that are denied to Ada by her cruel mother who abuses her and treats her very badly. When um, the British government decides that they need to evacuate the city of London due to the London Blitz, Ada sees this as her chance to go um, evacuate to the countryside and live with a new family. So she gets her brother and they leave very early in the morning without their mother's permission and travel up north on, on one of the children trans, children's transports to a new town where, they're, where the town forces a woman named Susan to take them in. And Susan, who has her own tragedy in her past, which has made her very sad, um, learns to love these children. But will Ada ever learn to trust anyone when the person she was supposed to trust the most was the cruelest person in her life? In her life? Will she ever be able to lead a normal life? Will she ever be able to get the operation she needs to fix her foot? You really have to read this extraordinary book by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. It is just lovely. And there's a sequel, so it's even better. <laughs> Wish Tree is by Catherine Applegate, who is a local writer, but Wish Tree is told from the perspective of red, this oak tree here. And as you can see in the tree live all these animals that make it its home. And also every May 1st, families in the area put wishes on their tree that they hope to come true in the year. So there might be wishes like, I hope I get a new, you know, uh, a new, new car, or I hope uh, my dad feels better. And one day a little girl who lives in the house across from the tree named Samar, who is a refugee whose family has just moved in, ties a wish to the wish tree that says, I wish I could have a friend. Samar lives next door to a little boy, um, I think his name is Richard, whose family will not allow him to speak to her or her family. They disagree with having them in their town. And one day when someone carves the word leave into the tree and directs it to Samar's family, the rest of the community has to decide what kind of community are, are we? Are we a welcoming community or are we the kind of people that drive people out of our community because they aren't like us. If you want to read an extraordinary but very small book, Wish Tree is just so great. And our school itself is going to do a one school, one book. The, the entire school is gonna read this book in January. And I'm so excited. It's so lovely. The next book I chose was Gracefully Grayson. And Grayson is a little uh, boy who knows that he's really a girl and that and he just can't figure out how to express that to his family. And with the support of local friends and a caring teacher, he learns how to be authentically himself. And I really like this one. There's another one called George, which is very famous, which is actually now changed its name to Melissa's story. Um, but this one, I just, it just, I, I have really enjoyed this one in particular. Another series I wanted to mention, have, if you've ever heard of the, um, Rick Raridan, Percy Jackson series. Has anyone heard of that? Percy Jackson, yeah, some of you. They are fantasy series and he wrote them for his son who um, had dyslexia. So he wrote this amazing fantasy series about how a boy with dyslexia in the modern day was really the son of a Greek god. And he gets to face off against all the 
legends of Greek mythology. And from there, he went, it's uh, hugely popular. From there, he went on to write one about the Romans and then one about the, um, the uh, Norse mythology. But what has been really extraordinary is he now uses his star power to help these other authors write similar books use, um, using their own mythology from their own culture. So rather than write those stories himself, he has formed a press with Disney Press and they hire writers who have ideas for books. And then he teaches them how to make his, their books appeal to his audience. So he kind of leans, lends his star power to them. So these are extraordinary. I cannot keep these on my shelves at work. Um, they're just so great. So you can see that there is um, Indian mythology. This is Mexican mythology, Korean mythology, Cuban mythology, uh, oh, Tristan Strong is extraordinary. That is African mythology. Um, this is also, this is Mexican mythology. This one is Mesopotamian. So kind of where Iraq is these days, mythology. Um, and again, Korean mythology. And these books are so well done. I cannot, rec each one is as good as the last and they're so very different. Um, and I love what he's doing. I just think that's such a, such the right thing to do. Finding Juni Kim. This one's a little bit older than the other ones I had mentioned, but I really like this book. This is um, written by Ellen O, oh, who is a wonderful writer, and this is about Juni Kim, who is a Korean American, and she is one of very few um, minority kids at her majority white school, and one day um, in the gym, there is, they have racist writing in the gym, and she and her friends get together and initially they're horrified, but then her friends are like, no, what? you know what, enough. We need to educate people about us so that this won't keep happening. And they decide to launch a public service campaign describing their culture so other kids can learn about them. But Junie is embarrassed by the whole thing. In middle school, it's just hard anyway. She doesn't want to be involved. So her friends kind of cut her off. So not only is she struggling with the way people are treating her, particularly one bully who's constantly going after her, but She's now been cut off from her friends and she actually attempts suicide. She doesn't succeed and her parents panic. They are just horrified. So they take Junie to see a therapist. And meanwhile, while she's getting the therapy before she can go back to school, she has an assignment from school to interview someone from another generation. So she interviews her grandfather who tells her about his experiences during the 1950s in Korea, during the Korean War. Um, and all the reasons why he left Korea to come to the United States to be safer. And so she's kind of figuring out who am I today? How can I be safe in the United States today? And learning about her grandparents' experience coming here. Um, it's just, I could not say enough for this book. It is just lovely. Um, these are fabulous new books. These are books that are all written in verse. So these, that means that these books are all poetry. Other Words from Home is about a young Syrian refugee who is forced to come to the United States. They have to leave her father behind um, so he can take care of the family business while her mother who's pregnant and her sibling come and live with an uncle. So she's trying to adjust to be, being in America, being a refugee in America. And at the same time, she's very excited because she's very soon going to get her hijab, um, which happens when young girls in the Muslim faith have their first period and she is just so excited for this rite of passage. Um, but how will her friends at school react when all of a sudden she starts covering her hair? If she's made friends, will they stay her friends? What will the Americans think of this? Because it's not familiar to them. So that's an extraordinary book. Red, White and Whole is about an Indian American who's trying to, first generation, trying to be as American as she can possibly be. Meanwhile, she's getting pulled back into the family, especially when her beloved grandmother gets ill and is in the hospital and she needs to help her family take care of her grandmother. Alone is about a girl who um, she and her friends decide to trick their parents and stay overnight in their grandparents' cottage until their parents are divorced. So she tells the dad she's with the mom, she tells the mom she's with the dad. But while they're at the, while she is at this cottage, her parent, friends never show up, the entire town gets evacuated and she ends up entirely by herself for four years. How will she survive? She can't get a hold of anyone. The power has been cut off to the town. Um, will she be able to survive? The only companion she has is her dog. So it's kind of like an echo to all those adventure books you may have read before, with, often with a boy as the protagonist. It's the same sort of thing, but with a girl protagonist. 
This one was really interesting. This is before the ever after. Um, this little boy, and I can't remember his name, but his dad was a professional football player and everyone loved him. He's such a great guy. All of his friends thought that this dad was the best. But when his dad forgets, starts to forget things due to brain injuries, due to concussion, and even forgets his own son's name, um, the family has to regroup and think about who are we now? We used to be the coolest family in town, but now dad is really suffering from brain injury due to his football career. Who, who are we then? Who are we now? Can we ever be the same again? It's really, really challenging and lovely, lovely book. Starfish is about a girl who um, is overweight and she's being bullied, but not just being bullied by kids at school. She's even being bullied, bullied within her own family. One day when she was a girl, a, a very young girl at her birthday party, she was wearing a bathing suit with a whale on it and she jumped in the pool for at her birthday party and her sister immediately called her a whale and that name stuck and now everyone at school calls her whale. But when she meets a new neighbor who encourages her to be herself and loves her for who she is, is she gonna be able to build the confidence to tell her family how she feels about them, the way they treat her and the way they encourage other people to treat her? You have to read Starfish to find out. It's just a voice we've needed to hear for a long time. And Crossover is about a boy and his twin brother who are amazing basketball players. But one day a girl comes to town that one of the boys uh, really likes and their relationship st starts to fall apart. Will they ever get to be uh, basketball buddies again? What does this mean? You've got to read Crossover by Kwame Alexander. Just so great. Does anyone have any questions? I know I'm just babbling. No? We're good? Okay. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> Um, I did want to mention this one. This is definitely a high school book, but it really had a huge impact on me. It's called A Long Way Down, and it's about a boy whose brother's been killed. It's by Jason Reynolds, who is extraordinary. But it's about a boy whose brother's been killed, and it's his job in his community to seek revenge. So he gets the, he gets the gun that his brother had used, and he starts going down the elevator, and he has 60 seconds to decide what he's going to do when he gets to the bottom of that elevator. And on every, every time... The elevator goes down, it stops on the next floor. Someone else who had contact, who knows a little bit more about what happened to his brother gets, who's, who's dead, I should say, the ghost of someone, steps on the elevator and tells him a little bit more, more about the story of what happened to his brother and why his brother died. It's, it's so emotional and so extraordinary. And just for me, that was definitely a window because that's not part of my experience. I've never had to deal with that. So I really valued Jason Reynolds telling me that story because he did come from a neighborhood where those sorts of things happened. So I appreciated his honesty. Um, and the last one I wanted to share with you is definitely late middle high school book or even an adult book. And it is one of my top three books because this is the book that helped me really understand how incredibly damaging racism can be. It is a graphic novel and it is about um, three people. But one, the thing that made the biggest impression on me when I read this about, gosh, 15 years ago, is there's one character who's Chinese American and he, there's constant microaggressions making him feel bad about himself to the point where he hates himself so much that he splits in two, where he has the white version of himself and he has the version of himself that he calls his cousin, that is all the stereotypes of Chinese people. And every year, this cousin, comes back for two months and just embarrasses him. Can he ever reconcile the two parts of himself, the two parts of his culture, being American and Chinese? You have to read this book. As you can see, it won the Prince Medal, whoops, sorry, for one of the best, um, for actually the best uh, YA book of the year and, um, or YA graphic novel of the year. It is extraordinary, very emotional, I loved it. If you liked any of these books, and there are a lot of other books, I had to choose just a few. As my friend Melissa, who's also a librarian, said, um, there are so many books, and there should be so many books. There should be so many more books. If you'd like to read some of these books or others, these are some of the uh, bookstores that Positive Charge would like to recommend. Third Eye Bookstore is a bookstore on Southeast 33rd. It's a Black-owned bookstore. Um, and they would love to help you. I was telling Sally, I noticed on their website that they have a Girl Scout trying to collect a thousand books for schools. And she has a wish list on their website. I'm just going to show you that. 
children's book blitz. Um, so if you don't want to make the effort of going to a free little library, there's someone who's willing to do it for you. And she has books that she's chosen that she would love for you to purchase and share. And there's that Tristan Strong book I told you about. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then uh, Annie Bloom's bookstore is in Capitol Highway in um, Multnomah Village. Green Bean Books is wonderful. Jan's Bookshop is a new and used bookstore on First Street in Beaverton. I believe it's new and used. Um, Children's Places on Fremont. And of course, Powell's is fabulous. And you can get books from wherever you like. These are just some that we wanted to recommend that are local because we love having local bookstores in our city. And coming soon, there'll be um, a project to build free little libraries. We'll add to the amount of libraries that are in Portland. So please join Positive Charge in reading your own book, reading books that reflect the experiences different from your own, discussing those books with friends in person, on social media, or in a book club, and gift those books to others through our, in our community through free little libraries, the Children's Book Bank, et cetera. Like I said, your own kids' classrooms or um, churches often have like, or, or synagogues will often have a library that kids can pull from. Feel free to donate there as well. Does anyone have any questions? I know that was a lot of me talking. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That was so good. There is a question, but I just had to say that first. Oh, yes. <laughs> so good. I just okay. like, hello. Ah. Um, <laughs> There is a question in the chat and hold on a second. I have to go back to it. Um, would you consider all of these books appropriate for young children um, besides this one? And that, it, the question actually came in when you were speaking about a specific book. So let's go back. I would consider, I would probably put Finding Junie Kim because it has um, some disturbing parts of the war in it that are really disturbing. I would probably put that in my like uh, middle high school range. I wouldn't have those books in my elementary school. All of these others I do have in my elementary school. So I have all of these novels in verse and um, they've been really fabulous because a lot of kids did not read much over, at least at my school, over the um, pandemic when they were home, when they were homeschooling. So these books where they're in verse have been a great entryway for them to get back into reading because it's not too much text, but it's appropriate to their age level. Um, these are wonderful. They are huge though. So those are for your really good readers, um, but they're really great. And they, I should also say the audiobooks are a great option. They're just not easy for us to share in this project. Um, this is a very small book. Wish Tree is, like I said, we're going to read that as a K-5 book at our school. That It's appropriate for everyone. It's a great read aloud for your kids. Um, this is probably fourth, fifth grade, maybe even third grade, depending on the third grader. That's the other thing, too, is you kind of want to choose that. Prairie Lotus, fourth, fifth grade, and that matches um, the fourth grade curriculum where they're studying Oregon Trail and um, the, you know, people moving west to the pioneers. So this is a great book to have if you have a student who's uh, in, in fourth grade or if even fifth grade. Uh, Long Walk to Water, probably fourth and fifth grade. Indian No More, fourth and fifth grade. And I can make this promise the same. This is a picture book. So these are for young children and it's really wonderful. These are all for young children. I would read them with kindergartners. Although this one is a little long for kindergartners, but you could at home, you know, with the class, I usually wait till second grade with these ones because we can have a lot of great discussions, but you can absolutely read them to kids. There's nothing untoward in any of these books. And this one, everyone should read it and everyone should own it. It's just extraordinary. Did that answer your question? Looks like there might be some more. I hope so. <coughs> I have a question for you. Um, and everyone can unmute at this time if you want um, to ask a question. Um, I had a question about, um, of course, you know, keeping confidentiality in mind. Do you have um, children or their families come to you and ask about um, book recommendations to help them learn more about themselves or even to learn more about other people 
in their families or in their neighborhoods for any variety of reasons. Absolutely. Yeah, that's down. And also teachers too, if they're trying to help a student with an issue. So they might choose to read a book that although they wouldn't read it to that student, they will read it to themselves so that they know how to help that student just to get a little bit of an insight and know maybe even sometimes when we're trying to help someone or trying to understand something, we don't even know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And so that's why many of these books can be a great opportunity in that way because they give you the questions to ask, like, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. Do you have any instances that come to mind? Hmm. I can talk about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's what I'm trying to think about. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly been, um, there's a book called The Breaking News when bad things have happened where, um, and you just don't know how to talk to your kids about it. It's just a wonderful book about, you know, the adults are all upset. What can I do as a little kid do? How do I react when I can tell all my adults are upset? They keep looking at their phones. They keep looking at the TV. I don't know what to do. And how do you as an adult understand what you're showing the kids and how they might be feeling that even though you're trying to protect them you're not talking about it you're still reacting to something that they feel emotionally so I think that's a really good example especially like as the pandemic broke like we did a lot of reading of that particular book um uh I have um children from a lot of different tribes at my school and they really mm -hmm. Um, love checking out books, particularly ones, if I can find ones that are about their specific tribe. And I work really hard at that. Um, and last year, oh, I have a favorite story. Last year, I had a young girl who was Indian American. She and her three sisters went to our school. And um, I started feeding her books with Indian American main characters, which I've only recently been able to get. And by the end of like five of them, she's like, I am only eating books with characters that look like me. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can get you more books. But it was so wonderful because she'd never seen herself in a book before. But when she, she um, read that one, I mentioned Red, White, and Whole, and she just saw her family. And it just, and it took her a while to read it. And she, she loved it so much. She read the afterword and memorized it and came to me and said, my favorite part of the whole book was here. And she was quoting the, the author's afterword about why she wrote that book. And then, so I tweeted her comments to the author who responded and I was able to print out that for the student where the author who looks like her as part of Indian American culture was able to say, oh my gosh, that meant so much to me that your student said that. So she has that, she has a connection with an author, a book that looks like her and an author that looks like her. And it just meant the world to her. It was so great. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> 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 that Amazing. Is awesome. Yeah. Any other questions or anything I can help with? Well, I hope you guys participate. I hope you will find some good books. And like I said, if you go to any of those bookstores, the people there will have tons of recommendations, particularly if you're looking for something specific that relates to someone you know that you're interested in finding more information about, or if you, um, uh, or, you know, something you are, have always wondered about and want to know more information about. Um, it's such a great opportunity to kind of have those windows into other people's lives. Or sometimes seeing yourself, the mirror of yourself reflected in a way you didn't expect. Because your experience could be experienced by one of the authors in this diverse book, but they have a different reaction to it than you did. And you get to learn the reasons why that might be the case. Mm -hmm. I'm loving that I found two books on your recommended books that I have sitting on my shelf waiting for me to read Ooh. and some by your, one of the authors that you mentioned as well. And I, one book that you sh shared, I think I might've gifted to one of my nieces a couple of years ago. So I'll have to ask my brother about that later. Um, I think that I sent uh, the war that saved my life to one of my nieces one year. It's so I so think that good. I did. And you said there was a sequel. So now I have to look for the sequel. <laughs> the war, the war, I finally won. Ah. And it's, it's really, really, those books are just so great because we do meet a lot of people who've had really bad experiences in their lives. 
And their response is to push everyone away. And that's what that main character is doing. And how do you embrace someone who's like a porcupine who just wants to push you away as fast as they can, even though they need you, or even though, though they need, in that case, they need to stay with Susan. She needs that support from the, that character, Susan. But at the same time, she's just pushing her away as hard as she can because she doesn't trust anyone anymore because her mother was so awful to her. Um, we, we met those people. And it's, it's really wonderful to have that insight into how that comes to be. This was really good. I love this. Okay. <laughs> you know, I read the, one of the books that you mentioned, um, you gave me several titles. And um, the first one that I read, uh, Front Desk, is yes. um, one that you mentioned. And I read that and I didn't know anything about Chinese immigrants and uh, didn't know anything. And even reading that and gaining a couple or three pearls, you know, now gives me a better familiarity, a better sensitivity, um, you know, uh, just as you said, a window into somebody else's life, better understanding, much better. Yeah, that's what this is about. We're so lucky to live right now where we have those opportunities because when I was a kid, we didn't have those books. And it's exactly. so great to be able to take advantage of that, of the, of the willingness of people to share with us. Your statistics are stunning because 2018, I was very surprised by that. Yeah, I've worked very hard to make my school library look like the kids at my school. And it's been very difficult. It's been very, very difficult because the books just weren't there. Um, but just in the past couple of years, they have started coming. And I actually got a grant this past year from McDonald's to add diverse books to my collection, which was lovely. Our local McDonald's franchises, so not the corporate, but the local restaurants in Vancouver gave me some money to diversify my collection. And it's the books have just flown off the shelves. The kids just love seeing themselves in books. It's really important. Do you know if um, older than um, children's books, like um, young adult and, uh, um, and adult books are being represented now in the same way as yes. young there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jason Alexander, one of that, that author I showed you at the end, he has a lot of books. Um, they, I just don't know them as well, so I wouldn't feel comfortable recommending them because I have, I have to read so much for my job. I only... I really focus on these during the school year. I just read K-5 books constantly. Um, and in the summer and on vacations, I get to read adult books. But I know there's a ton of really wonderful literature out there. There's one I want to really, I want to read called Firekeeper's Daughter, which has been highly recommended, which is a fantasy based on indigenous legend, but I don't know what tribe, but it's been like the buzz around it is just amazing. So I'm very, very excited to get to a break where I can read that book. <laughs> nice. As we are sitting here, I'm going to order it from Pals, which was another gift I got from you. I'm only ordering from Pals. Be proud of me. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for supporting local businesses. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Oh, it seems like maybe, if, unless people have other questions, I'm happy to answer them, but. If not, thank you for coming and I hope you do participate and, you know, send out pictures on social media with the hashtag compassion is lit and let us know what you are doing to help spread diverse books around our community. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Thank you. Very nicely done. Thank you.